so this afternoon, I will be talking about marine ecosystem and the threat and potential impact on fish health. And here, when I'm talking about fish health, it's more about parasitism and how parasites can impact fish. Uh, is it not going? Ah, yes. So thank you, Marta. You did already the representation of myself. So we go very briefly again about that. So I did my bachelor in ecology in Toulouse, then moved to Portugal to do my master uh, in marine ecology, na Faculdade de Ciência da Universidade de Lisboa. And this is where I met Marta, where I work with uh, cleaner fish in the Azores. And then a few years after, I went to Australia, where I did my PhD in marine biology at James Cook University. And in between my master and my PhD, I was very lucky uh, to be part of a very cool scientific project, mainly investigating uh, cleaner fish and parasite in Brazil, in the Bahamas, and also in Australia. And now I'm a project researcher and logistic manager where I organize field work uh, for a project at the Paris, uh, Université Paris Sciences et Lettres, <laughs> uh, where we basically travel around to study fish. And I'm also applying for a postdoc in Europe. So for my PhD, I work with the impact of habitat degradation on fish health, but this was only a subset of my PhD. So the main focus was to understand the potential negative impact that cleaner fish may have on other fish while interacting with them. So basically here, for example, we have cleaner fish in the gills of other fish that we call the clients, and they have a very close and intimate contact with uh, this client. So uh, we, 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 we hypothesis that this uh, client and cleaner could actually be transmitting parasite when, with each other. So I first suggested new hypotheses in a review published in a review of fish biology and fisheries about the potential for parasite transmission between fish during cleaning interaction. So basically the idea here is uh, when we have a client fish here in dark color, that need uh, to get uh, cleaning services uh, with the client here. And while we have this very close and uh, intimate contact, there is a possibility of parasite transmission between the client and the cleaner. And then the cleaner transport this parasite to another client. And then when this cleaner interact with the new client, then actually can um, tra transmit this parasite to the new client. So basically it's an indirect transmission from one client to another. And one of the important first step was to understand if actually cleaner fish have parasite in the wild. So are cleaner fish clean or not? And we found that actually one of the most specialized cleaner fish have indeed a community of parasite comparable to other fish from the same region and from the same family. And finally, we found that the same cleaner fish can indeed um, transport and potentially transmit this parasite to other fish. Okay, so for this talk now, I will be focusing uh, mostly on the effect of habitat degradation on ectoparasite infection on fish. So first I will introduce what is parasitism and how parasite can impact the host. Then I will move on with the concept of the disease triangle, which is an important concept where we want to understand the, um, the dynamic relationship between a uh, host and parasite when including the environment. And then um, understanding how habitat degradation can impact this relationship between a uh, host and a uh, parasite. And then I will move on with a study case from my PhD and then briefly mention some possible future direction. So ectoparasites are organisms that infect the skin of other organisms that we call the host. And they are very detrimental for the host. Um, ectoparasites are everywhere in terrestrial, but also in marine environment. And here are some examples of a terrestrial uh, ectoparasite, for example, like uh, lice, mite, ticks, mosquito and fleas. Um, and in marine environment, the most prevalent uh, parasite are um, uh, some copepod uh, parasite, isopod, and also leeches. So parasites negatively impact the health of the host. They can physically damage the host by causing, uh, for example, skin inflammation or loss of appetite. 
They can also physiologically impair their host by altering their growth or stressing them or also altering their behavior. And they can also transmit diseases. And in extreme cases, even lead to the death of the host. So the concept of the disease triangle is a concept that is widely used in disease ecology and epidemiology when uh, to understand when a disease will occur. So it includes the environment, the pathogen, here the parasite, and the host. So basically, when we have a suitable environment, a virulent parasite, and a susceptible host, it is very likely that a disease will occur. And the disease triangle has been used in several studies to understand um, the dynamic of the three corner. And this corner can be uh, altered according to the organism in question and the study. So for, for example, other uh, pathogens and parasites can be used such as viruses or some uh, pathogenic fungus, for example. Or, or other organisms that animal can be used as a true understand host, for example, plants and how pathogen may influence plant in a given environment. And finally, more complex relationship can be investigated while using the disease triangle, such as how parasite and host respond physiologically when we have environmental changes. And this is what has been um, mostly investigated in the last couple of years, trying to understand how um, changes in the environment can disrupt this dynamic between host and parasite. And this is actually applicable to all ecosystems that are affected by climate change um, and habitat degradation in general. Um, an example of ecosystem that is extremely diverse and actually one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world are coral reefs. And many coral reef fishes rely on coral substrate and structure to feed, as you can see on this picture, to use as habitat and shelter, and also as nursery ground. And coral reefs are not only a hotspot of fish diversity, but also parasite. So parasite biodiversity in tropical coral reefs is extremely high. But coral reefs are particularly vulnerable uh, to habitat degradation from stressors, including marinate wave, leading the coral to bleach, but also pollution, poor water quality and um, sedimentation, and also overfishing. So following long periods of thermal stress, coral may lose their algal symbiont and start it to bleach. And this bleaching event may be uh, reversible, but if the thermal stress is too expensive, damage can be permanent and lead to coral mortality. And the impact of coral mortality have many cascading effects. For example, this transition from a uh, coral to algal dominated stage involves colonizer on the dead coral, such as cyanobacteria and the atoms that emit toxic compound which in turn can uh, impact the environmental chemistry around. And this is very critical for fish. Indeed, most coral reef fish uh, use a sensory cue and mostly olfactory cues to communicate and for survival. And larval and juvenile dumpster fish, for example, use olfactory cue for many important stages of their first week of life. For example, to settle near a conspecific, the larvae will, will use uh, olfactory cues to find conspecific and settle in the coral. Also to smell a predator. So juvenile fish will use olfactory cue to smell a predator and hide inside the coral. And also to send alarm cue to conspecific. So when they, we have predation that occur, these little fish will send alarm cues to conspecific to tell them there is a predator around. However, study found that these three vital steps uh, for larval and juvenile fish to survive are highly disturbed in dead coral environment due to the release of this toxic component uh, released by a dead coral colonizer and the mortality increase in dead coral environment. On the other hand, parasite community have been increasingly used as biological indicator of water quality, which often reflect uh, ecosystem health. 
So while crustacean ectoparasite seems to be more susceptible uh, to chemical and biological um, pollution present in the water, such as ammonium, nitrate, or turbidity, other parasites respond positively to um, eutrophication, crude oil, and industrial effluent. So basically, parasites respond differently to habitat degradation, but interestingly, some of them adapt and actually thrive in degraded habitat. And one ectoparasite of interest for this talk are gnated isopods. So these parasites are ectoparasites and they live, uh, they are very common in tropical reefs and they have two different stages. So they are free living first when they live on the benthos and then when they found a fish, they will jump into the fish, attach to it and feed with their blood. And when they are full, they will come back to the benthos. So they're basically marine mosquitoes. And study on gnated survivorship found that they are susceptible to marine heat wave where their mortality increase. However, ocean acidification do not impact their survivorship. <laughs> and what I think is really interesting is that gnated, um, recent study found that gnated parasites actually prefer to live in the um, dead coral and rubble than in live coral. And this is because the live coral can actually eat the gnated with their polyps. So basically, uh, we know that native prefer to live in uh, dead and rubble habitat, and larval and juvenile fish are disrupted from the water chemistry around that coral. So the next question here is, what happened to the susceptibility of the fish when exposed to these parasites in degraded environment? Or most broadly, how habitat degradation affects the dynamic relationship between parasite and host? And this brings us to one of the chapter of my PhD. Uh, sorry for now, I will hide the title of this uh, paper because there's a substantial part of the result in the title. Uh, but the main aim was to investigate the effect of habitat degradation of the susceptibility of fish to ectoparasite. So we conducted this study at Lizard Island in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So the reef around lizard were, uh, have been affected by two severe tropical cyclone and two major bleaching events between 2014 and 2017. So the coral reef, uh, the coral cover around lizard island declined abruptly over this period. And this is how the reef looked like at lizard island in 2016. And this study here was conducted uh, between uh, 2018 and 2020. So the reef was already recovering and actually in 2020, the reef were uh, actually pretty great. So they can uh, recover. So the main objective again of this uh, um, study was to compare the infection rate of gnated isopod on juvenile, but also on adult common damselfish at Lizard Island um, that we exposed to three different water treatment. The first one mimicking that coral, the second one mimicking live coral, and the third one a control with no coral. So basically this is how the experiment looked like. We had three headed tanks, one with dead coral, one with live coral, and one with seawater. And then we got, we, we took only the water from this three headed tank to run our experiment. So in the experimental tank, we didn't have any coral at all, at all only the water. So um, we, we, uh, we work with the species Pomacentris ibonensis, which is a, species, a very common species of damselfish at Lizard Island. The juvenile, the larvae fish were caught using light traps, these uh, little cages here. So basically at night we put these uh, cages in the water and the light attracts the fish and then they go trapped inside uh, the cage and then we can bring back the fish to the lab. And then the adult fish were caught using an anesthetic solution of clove oil. And then we could uh, catch them with the little nets and then put them in bag and then bring them back to the lab. For the gnatids, we had a culture of this parasite at Lizard Island uh, that allow us to run this experiment, but also many other experiments. 
And uh, the species of um, coral that we use was uh, Postilopora damicormis, which is a very common species of coral at Lizard Island as well. So we use the same uh, coral for, uh, to test the live coral and also the dead coral was the same species. So this is the design uh, for the juvenile fish. So we had, we separate the juvenile with the, uh, with the adult. So it was two different experiment. So with the juvenile fish, we expose one little fish with one gnated parasite. And we expose them with only one gnated because they are very vulnerable to infection. So they basically could die even with one parasite. So we had to be very careful about that. Um, so per trial, we had 60 fish, 20 per treatment, and then one gnated per fish. And this is how it looked like. So in each little container that you can see here, we had water. And this water was uh, from one of the three treatments. And during the experiment, we had no idea which treatment it was. So it was completely random. And in each of these little tanks, we had one fish and the one parasite. And now for the adult fish, the, um, the design was very similar, but instead of having one parasite, we had five of them because they are much less vulnerable to infection than juvenile. And because also we put them in bigger tank, so we had more space and it was easier to work with five parasites. So looking now at the design for the adult fish, we had six per trials, two per treatments and five gnated per fish. And then for, uh, for the adults and the juvenile, we, have, we had 10 replicates per, um, per juvenile and per adult. We run the experiment for 12 hours at night. And then every two hours, we check for uh, the juvenile fish. And every four hours, we check for the adult fish. And this is what we check exactly. We look at infection, if it happened or not. We looked at fish mortality. And we look at native mortality. So basically, if the parasite was not around, it's probably because the fish ate it. So now I guess you want to ask me, so how do you check for parasite infection? So it can be very tricky to find a gnated in the water because they are very tiny, about one millimeter 0.5. Um, so um, it can be tricky to find them, but when we find them, it's easy to check the status. So this is how a parasite looks like, a gnated, before feeding on the fish. And this is how a gnated looks like after feeding on the fish. So it's engorged with the blood of the fish. And sometimes we could even found uh, the gnated still attached to the fish here. So now going with the result of, of this um, study. So here we have the gnated infection rate on juvenile fish. So on the left side, we have the raw data uh, with the X axis with the three uh, different water treatment. So no coral, live coral, and then coral. And on the Y axis, the infection. So zero represent no infection and one infected. But uh, most importantly, to look on the right side of this uh, graph and um, where we have the statistical result from our binomial GLMM. So fish were much more infected in the water issues from dead coral. And the probability of a fish in the dead coral treatment being infected by gnated was twice as high as the no coral and the live coral treatment. And there was no difference between the no coral and the live coral treatment at all. When looking now at the juvenile fish mortality, uh, so um, it was actually pretty low less than 5% mortality. And we didn't find any difference in the mortality rate between the seawater treatments, but we saw different between the infection categories. And when talking about categories here, I just wanted to say that when a fish were exposed and infected by a parasite native, the probability was 9.7% um, of dying. But when the fish were exposed and non-infected, the probability plummeted to only 1.6%. So the mortality was related to parasite infection directly and not the exposure of uh, the water from the different water treatment. And here are the results with the gnated infection rate on adult fish. So again, on the left side, we have um, um, the raw data 
but this time with the proportion of gnated infection per fish out of the five. And on the right side, we have uh, the statistical result from the GLMM. But here we can see that we didn't find any difference between the infection rates uh, between uh, the live coral, no coral, and the dead coral. So overall, we found that the juvenile and adult damsel fish are impacted differently by seawater treatment, mimicking degraded and healthy habitat. While the juvenile were twice as likely to be infected when exposed to dead coral seawater comparing to live coral or no coral, the infection rate uh, with the adult was not affected by the seawater treatments at all. And these results are alarming because gnated can have huge impact on larval and juvenile fish. Indeed, they can decrease their swimming performance. <clears throat> They can decrease their escape response. So that is when a fish need to escape a predator, the time they get to actually run away. And they can also reduce the fish growth. And as I mentioned before, they can succumb to gnated infection even when infected with one parasite. And this is what we call micropredation. So when bringing together a result with the result previously found uh, in other study, this is how a schematic um, of a healthy versus degraded environment look like. So previous, previously study found that gnated parasites prefer to live in degraded environments and are more abundant than in a live coral. And this pattern could be uh, due to predation from coral upon gnateds. And recent study also found that juvenile of the same species that we uh, studied here prefer to live in healthy uh, habitat over degraded environment. But adult of the same species didn't show any uh, difference and any preference at all. And this might be due to the uh, chemical cue released by the dead coral that affect the juvenile fish uh, and also RMQ responses. And here, we propose that in degraded habitat, juvenile fish may be more susceptible to gnated infection than in healthy habitat. And this might be also due to this chemical cue released by the dead coral colonizer, which hinder parasite avoidance. Consequently, negative parasite-driven impacts on juvenile fish due to coral death are very likely. So coming back to our, our, this, this triangle here, we can say that uh, when we have changes in the environment, such as a degraded habitat, it actually disturbs the relationship between parasite and host. So looking at a uh, um, um, future direction of this work, it would be very interesting as a next step to analyze uh, the water sourcing from the dead and live coral to try to understand which chemical components participate to this disturbance and might be detrimental for the juvenile fish. And finally, another future direction that will be very, uh, very important um, to, uh, to understand will be uh, to uh, investigate and understand which mechanism drive these differences uh, we observe in the infection between juvenile and adult when exposed to dead coral. What is the dead coral doing to the fish after all? So it would be great to understand which exact physiological mechanism is altered that consequently drives uh, these changes in behavior. And with that, I would like to thank uh, IRC Center of Excellence for Coral Study, my center in, uh, in Australia, in Townsville, and also James Cook University, Lizer Island Research Station, and my amazing team that works super hard doing fair work for this study. And thank you very much all for watching. Uh, if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask me now, or you can send me also an email whenever you want. Thank you very much.